Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, so Robert Castillo is an upright and electric basis composer and arranger, visual artist, meditation instructor, and community organizer. This Kansas City native creates with the intent to imbue his environment with positivity in order to leave behind beauty in his wake. After graduating from North Kansas City High School in 2010, Robert attended North Central College in Naperville, Illinois, majoring in jazz studies and minoring in environmental studies. Shortly after, he moved to the West Coast where he accepted a position with AmeriCorps as the K-8 music teacher at Fossil Elementary School in Fossil, Oregon. Along with developing his own curriculum, he taught lessons on various instruments, including piano, drums, bass, violin, cello, and guitar. Castillo found himself with ample free time in Central Oregon High Desert, during which he further developed his meditation practice, composed and arranged music, and created visual art. Following his time in Fossil, Robert moved to Portland, Oregon, where he founded the Groove Jazz Ensemble, the Sextet. Consisting of three horns and three piece rhythm section, the Sextet plays music to move to and to be moved by. Much of the music written in Fossil can be heard on their first album, In a Natural State. When Robert moved back to Kansas City in the fall of 2016, he reformed the group and released two more albums. Their third Among Friends was well received, garnering recognition from Kansas City's NPR member station. Aside from the sextet, Robert performs all over the United States, collaborating with musicians of any genre. One of these groups, the Standard Vocal Jazz Ensemble, has been presented seven times with the Downbeat Music Award. Castillo also composes electronic music under the name Blob Castle. His most recent EP titled Music for Art Show is a collection of songs written specifically to accompany several of the pieces in this exhibit. In March of 2018, Castillo was challenged to create enough visual art to host a solo show that, follow, fo that following December. Little did he know accepting this challenge would result in a deep and passionate love for creating visual art. As with music, his style is varied. His subjects include post-classes Mayan imagery, geomic abstraction akin to Kaminsky, and at times incorporates Van Gogh-like impressionistic backgrounds. The mediums he uses include oil, acrylic, watercolor, gouache, color pencil, and paint and pens. Robert is a firm believer in donating time through volunteering. He helps with several organizations, including Art as Mentorship and Cross Science Community Outreach, where he also serves as on the Young Professionals Board. So without further ado, I give you guys Robert Castillo. Thank you for the introduction, Isabel, and thank you everyone for being here. I'm really stoked to have this opportunity to go a little bit deeper into some of the paintings. Uh, I prepared a video that I would like to begin with. Um, the video basically is a walkthrough through the exhibit where I kind of speak uh, a little bit about each of the pieces. Um, but I suppose before I hop into that, I would like to open it up in case anyone does have any questions. Uh, if anyone has anything right out of the bat that they'd like to know, uh, feel free to, uh, to ask. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get this queued up. If you do have something, just feel free to, to ask. Right on, here we go. So I'll start with this video. Um, the video itself is about six minutes and there are captions so you can read along. Here we go. Hello, my name is Robert Castillo and I am here at the Kansas City Artist Coalition where my show Variegated is on display from May 7th through the 28th of 2021. I'm gonna take you inside just to give you a brief description of each of the paintings that I have on display. Come on in. So here at the very front of the show, we have a couple of my paintings, the bassist and portrait of my father. The bassist is actually a self-portrait. I received my undergraduate degree as a jazz bassist. The, the expression on the face is actually meant to be both joyful and full of anguish. Joy, because playing is just so much fun. It's, it's really such an unparalleled experience. And anguish, because I actually have experienced a lot of damage to my muscular nervous system as a result of playing super intensely for 15 years, to the point where playing gigs is actually a pretty painful experience. You'll notice the hair here is a specific sort of squiggle blobby design. You will see that in a little bit also, that, that theme comes through in some other paintings. This painting right here, Portrait of My Father, was a pretty important in just the development of my relationship with with this man. We've 
had quite an interesting <laughs> relationship through the years. This painting really worked to mend the relationship to an extent. This frame here was created by my friend Boris Stansik. We collaborated on the design and he used a CNC machine to create this frame. And I'm just really, really overwhelmed with happiness on how this frame pairs with this, with this painting. This is actually only the second time that I painted a portrait in the oil glazing style. And the first time I ever painted leaves. This painting right here is titled Hashtag Social Distancing. This was created in the first few months of shutdown of 2020. It has a lot of themes related to the pandemic. This painting is to an extent also a self-portrait where this is me right here holding a cell phone, video chatting with some friends. This right here, kind of represents a human genome because I was doing some research and discovered that viruses have a tendency to become retroviruses, embed themselves in the human genome, and are responsible for the creation of the placenta, for memory development, and many other things. One other little detail to mention here, all these little dots and globules are kind of meant to represent those respiratory particles that could potentially hold the virus. This painting right here is titled Blob Factory number 4127. My nickname is Blob. This painting was kind of an experiment on how perspective and line and form could direct a person's eye through. And so it's just really fun to follow the lines through this painting. This painting right here is titled The Drummer. It's not actually a square, it's a, it's a rectangle, it's 39 by 40. This painting is just really meant to be an expression of that, that, that fun, that just cathartic energy that is expressed whenever you're on stage playing in front of people and you're just in the flow and it's just, ah, <laughs> it's such an unparalleled experience. You'll notice again in the hair, that sort of blobby, limey design. And that actually is highlighted in this next drawing right over here. This is titled Embracing Change. This is kind of a throwback to how I began my visual art practice. I used to doodle like this in the margin of my college notebooks. And through the process of creating this drawing, I was just presented with those parts of myself that needed to develop, the, the parts of myself that were the least developed. Embracing that change was, was difficult and painful, but necessary. There's a lot of emotion tied up with this one. Two lines. This painting was a pretty fun improvisation on line, color, form. I really had very little forethought when creating this one. I just kind of went to the panel to create this one. It's titled Two Lines because this grayscale lines that go through, there are actually two of them. They, they don't connect to one another. They disconnect right here. Just at the top, there is an end to it. There are some sentiments that I was trying to express at various parts in here, but really it was just playing with color and form and how those could feel good with one another. This one was the first oil painting that I ever created. When I created it initially, it was actually in a horizontal orientation. Very, very recently did I realize it was, it, it presents much more nicely vertically. And it's really fun to have that sort of carefree approach to a painting where it can become its own thing over time and continue to develop uh, these circles back here. These actually took quite, quite some time to add in, but I'm very happy with how they bring out the structure and the form of these, this movement from the star of the show, the white trapezoid. This painting right over here is titled Lost in the Feed and is the first portrait in oil that I ever painted. It's actually based off of a painting I took of this person at a restaurant in Denver. She was just sitting there so bleak, you know, just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. I just, I just really felt that it was important to capture this because whenever we're just scrolling on our phones, this is what we look like. You know, we just look like almost so lifeless. I did create some music, a song for most of the paintings on display here. For the song that I created for this painting, Lost in the Feed, is actually the first time I ever wrote poetry and recorded. It's meant to further bring out the idea of how social media is designed to just keep us scrolling and scrolling and how that inhibits us from taking the time to learn ourselves more intimately, develop our own passions and interests. This is a portrait of my wife. She was having a great time doing a little photo shoot with this Coreopsis plant. She was actually smelling it as well. You can see there's a little bit of yellow on her nose from whenever she was smelling it. And I, I'm really happy with this painting because I feel it, it really shows just how lovely of a human Catherine is. Really, really wonderful person. Well, thank you for taking the time to listen to me give a brief description of each of these paintings. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you all might have and highly encourage you all to listen to the accompanying album, Music for Art Show, uh, which you'll be able to find on my website, robertcastillo.art.
Right on. So if you have not been to the gallery yet, uh, that was kind of a brief little walkthrough of the of the the exhibit, the gallery, the show. Um, I also did prepare a slideshow, a, a PowerPoint, kind of where I could present each of the paintings and then open it up for questions. And I also, on a lot of them, also provided uh, either a photo of a study or the source image for comparison of the painting in relation to the, the inspiration for it. So let me cue that up here. Cool. So here is the first painting that was that was over on display. Uh, this one's called The Bassist. And as I had mentioned in the video, this one is a, a self-portrait um, in that I, I do play the upright bass. I've been doing that for quite some time. Uh, and yeah, I don't necessarily want to repeat anything that I said in the video. Uh, I just want to present this here. Uh, feel free. I think I, I think the best way to, to approach this is probably just going to be if you have a question, just unmute and, and ask or put in the chat. I don't know. I'm not sure which one might be best. Perhaps, Isabel, you have an idea of how you want to navigate that. We can do either way if you want to go through it and then we can just save questions for after. Right on. Cool. Sounds good. Oh, right on. Well, that was an accident, but I'll embrace it. Uh, so this is the second painting that was on display. This one's called yeah, Portrait of My Father. And I included here uh, some progress shots on the process uh, just because I don't think that this process is discussed very much. Uh, I taught myself how to paint three years ago. I learned on YouTube and I found just the, it, it took a lot of scouring to find the, the YouTube videos that were the most beneficial. But I found one by a, a series by Kansas City painter, Ryan Delgado, of, of all people, you know, just someone in KC that was really cool, I thought. And, you know, just teaching this process here of doing, oh, excuse me, of doing the, the underpainting right, where you're just basically coloring, drawing with color, or excuse me, with, with just a, a dark brown, uh, and then adding the grisaille, the grayscale on top of that, and then adding the layers of color. And then this one is super interesting, uh, because if you'll notice in the one, two, three, four, five, okay, in the fifth progress shot, you'll see that in the top right hand corner, it's just kind of nebulous background space. I knew that I didn't want to have that, and so I put some leaves on top of it, uh, I just improvised some, you can see in the sixth, but I noticed that they were not compoundly palmate in structure as the rest of the avocado leaves are. So in the last one, in the last progress shot, you'll be able to see that I superimposed some uh, compoundly palmate avocado leaves into that spot. And I left it a little bit gray so you can see that I did also do a grisaille on top of the grisaille. Uh, so that was really cool. I really love learning new things. And learning how to paint in this style was, was quite an undertaking, but I'm, I love that. I love accepting new challenges. In fact, okay, so just very recently have I accepted two challenges to do something I've never done before. I'm going to be modeling in the West 18th Fashion Show on June 12th. I've never walked down a runway before, but shoot, let's do it. And then on the 11th, the, the, the day right, right before, I accepted a, a, a DJ gig. So I'm going to DJ Molly Balloons is an artist in town. She works with balloons. She makes beautiful dresses, structures. She's creating this immersive balloon experience for three weekends. And I'm going to DJ at one. So that'll be really fun to learn how to DJ and then put on a just a killer show. <laughs> okay, so next painting on the docket. This one's called hashtag social distancing and is how I felt, I painted this one in March of 2020, right? So we were only a few weeks into this thing and hardly anyone knew anything about anything about COVID. I mean, <laughs> we, I don't, we still hardly know anything about it. It's such a strange thing. Well, this is how I felt in the first weeks of it. Uh, you'll see that this, I, I mentioned it in the video at the beginning that this is more or less a self-portrait where that's my hand in the bottom right-hand corner holding a cell phone video, chatting with some friends. I've got my mustache up in there. Um, yeah, there's some other elements in here that have some specific meaning and reference, uh, but I want to make sure that I get through the, all the paintings before coming back to the depth of this one. Okay, so this one uh, I wanted to provide a couple studies for, so you can see that there was some thought, uh, some, some forethought involved. This bottom left one is the, uh, uh, the first one that I drew, and that one's pretty tiny. Uh, that one I think is maybe five by eight, something like this. 
The following one is a little bit larger and you can see that I was experimenting with some shadow, uh, some shadow effects within this one that didn't make themselves into the painting. If anything, there's a more of a luminous effect behind those fleshy blob things. I don't know. <laughs> this one was just, it just was something that popped out. Uh, so you can see the, the progression of the, the ideas and how they have translated to the final product there. Gosh, my favorite thing about this is just how the lines direct the eye. That's a really fun sensation for me to experience when looking at a painting. I really hope that that's replicated when you all look at it, just following the lines, how fun they move and change and flow and relate to one another. This next one is a drummer. And this one is a study that I created for this painting years before I actually created the final painting uh, to the point where I didn't even know that it was gonna be a, a study for this. That's a, it was meant to be Elvin Jones. He's one of my favorite jazz drummers. And what I, what I really enjoy about showing the study along with the actual, uh, the, the final product is you can see how the shapes and the, the predominant colors in each of the shapes uh, presented themselves in the final product. You can see that there's that yellow triangle in there, how it's incorporated, but it's not actually totally a yellow triangle. Uh, you can see how the bottom right of the, the, the study is meant to be more dominated by purple and yellow, or excuse me, purple and pink. So you can see how that translated over here, the blue square that more or less translates. So that was, that was really fun to be able to, to, to translate this super small six by six drawing to, you know, the largest canvas. I suppose this is the second largest canvas I've ever painted, third largest canvas I've ever painted. But yeah, really interesting transition there. This next one, is titled Embracing Change. There's a pretty deep story related to the title. Don't necessarily know that I want to get into that at this moment, um, but this is more or less a throwback to how I started painting, where, or excuse me, started creating visual art in the margins of my college notebooks. I would do these sorts of doodles, and I included this zoomed in cutout uh, from there, so you can just kind of see the level of detail involved. This is from the middle. You can see, well, yeah, you can see that that's coming from the middle there. Uh, this is just with a pen. I love, one of my favorite things to do is just draw clean lines or clean up lines. And whenever I'm creating in this way, I actually more so focus on how the negative space feels uh, more so than the lines, the, the space that I am creating. The, I suppose, the, yeah, the positive space, I suppose it's the opposite of negative space, uh, how the negative space feels because it is, I think that that is equally as important uh, if, if that feels good. It's, it's almost like a carving, I feel sometimes, like into marble, perhaps. That is actually a medium I would love to get into one day. That'd be really neat. Two lines. This one does not have a study or anything because this one was just a good old improvisation. Just feeling what felt good. It ended up, it ended up having a meaning afterwards. And I love that about uh, visual art about that process of creating visual art is that it can take on a significance after and that's just so beautiful and this one really showed me what I was trying to just work out in my own life in this time you can see that that blobby line design similar to the previous drawing expresses itself in the top right corner there and then this bottom left structure the rectangle with all the little bits and bits inside of it that one is not a direct nod to Kandinsky, my favorite painter, but that style, that, that form is definitely derived from his type of painting. The background is a whole bunch of little dots that took quite some time to put in there. But that's one of my things that I love about visual art is how obsessive you can get about it uh, because goodness, does it take some time. But yeah, that's the beauty of it. This next one, White Trapezoid, actually did have a study as well. Uh, this one is really fun to see not only how later on I decided to present it vertically, but it's also really interesting to just see how the different structures and forms changed, what stayed. Hmm. Yeah, I really like comparing, comparing the two here. You can see that I, in the, the study, I did actually have an idea to include the blobby line design stuff, but opted out in the final product. This is actually, yeah, the first oil painting that I ever created. That was a really nice introduction. And it was really interesting when I was creating this one, I 
as I was working with oil for the first time and then playing music, playing shows, playing gigs, specific notes and chords started taking on their own colors, which was very fascinating. It's not something I'd experienced before. The note F is now pink. Um, C's are like a sky blue. A's are the color white, or I mean, I guess the tint. Yeah, so that's really interesting that that sort of developed in tandem with oil painting. This one is titled Lost in the Feed, and I included the original photo. Uh, this is just a photo I took of a person at a restaurant because that look was so stunning. <laughs> that look was just so, I said in the video, so bleak. And I mean, I wanted to highlight how we look like that whenever we are just scrolling infinitely. Gosh, social media is such a weird thing because like, how do we promote our stuff without it? But I mean, you're just, uh, ah, it's a love-hate relationship, that's for sure. This frame, uh, as well as several of the frames that we've seen in here, well, this one was created by my friend, Travis. He's actually a coworker. And with this one, Travis uh, poured rose gold resin over this, over the, uh, <clears throat> over the wood, where it was meant to match the, it was meant to match the phone, the rose goldness there. And I think it's really cool the way that it complements the colors of the, the painting itself. Ah, I, this is one of my favorite little, this is actually the first oil portrait I ever painted. I really like this one. And then lastly, this painting is called uh, Catherine and the Coreopsis. This is a painting of my wife. You can see the source image right there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this was the first painting I, I painted uh, in the oil glaze style. It was interesting. This frame was given to me. A friend said, hey, I'm moving. I need to get rid of some, some stuff. Here's a frame. And so I created this painting for the frame. That's the first time I ever did that. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. Uh, man, oil painting is just so fun. It's so fun because it's so deep. It's so intricate. You can get so much detail. Hmm. Yeah, it's really fun. So that's pretty much all I have in terms of the slideshow. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to go ahead and pull that back up. I'm happy to pull up something from the video. You know, if any of you all have any questions or anything, uh, yeah, let's, let's hit it. Um, yeah, you guys, uh, like Marissa said, um, you can write your questions in the chat box or you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, I would like to start with a question. I want to ask how um, your relationship with music has impacted your painting practice. Yeah, that's a pretty, uh, hmm, there's a lot to unpack there. The first song that I ever wrote after painting incorporated a type of harmony that I had never used before. Uh, it was augmented uh, harmony, which, which means basically you stack major thirds. It is a very uh, disharmonious sound, very eerie, very odd. And I created a reggae song with this sort of harmony. And it was just very easy to notice like, oh, this is opening up different channels of, of creation within music, a, a type of creation that I've, I'm so familiar with. So that was really beautiful. Uh, in, in general, because I do have formal education in music, I do have so many shoulds, coulds, woulds, rights, wrongs, do, don'ts in my head in relation to music. And that most oftentimes expresses itself whenever I am composing music where my professor's voices say like, okay, you know, music typically does this in this instance, or like, you know, this is what you should do here, shouldn't do here. And I, you know, I silence those voices and then create what I actually want to create. But with visual art, because I have no instruction, uh, the last, the only music, excuse me, the only art class I took was in seventh grade. I took a trimester and I got a C. Uh, so that's the extent of that. So these shoulds, shouldn'ts, yes, no's, rights, wrongs of creating never embedded themselves for me in visual art. Um, so that's, I suppose that's tangentially related to your question in that that kind of expresses how I feel my sentiments toward music and how they might parallel themselves with visual art.
And um, since you have this like training in both, like um, I consider, even though you're self-taught, I still consider that to be training. I think it's really impressive that your your paintings are so great and you're self-taught. Um, but um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask how um, how your painting process and your musical process are different from one each other and how are they similar to one another? Mm. That's a good question. Well, they differ. One of the biggest ways in, in which they differ is that whenever I'm painting, I prefer to paint in silence. Uh, because music, you always have information coming to you so that whenever I'm practicing music or writing music or something, it's, I always have to be focused on that. And sure, I'll, I'll listen to music, I'll listen to podcasts whenever I'm painting, but I really like that I can create in silence, that that experience exists, silent creation, and not completely silent, you know, it's the sound of the paintbrush is its own beautiful thing, but that I can create and not have to have music. <laughs> I really like that. So that's one thing about the two different creative processes that is pretty significant for me. Hmm. One thing that is very similar in the way that I create, uh, whenever I'm composing music and whenever I'm painting, so much of it is just based on feel and intuition in a way that words cannot describe, especially with, especially with painting. I don't, I'm not entirely sure. Like I really do feel blessed that so much of it comes very intuitively. Like that is, you know, thank you universe for that, that ability, I suppose. But especially with painting, it's just so obvious, like how to shade something or where the light goes. It's, it's very easy to imagine that uh, and, and then just kind of follow it. So that expresses itself with music uh, where it's so easy. Oh my goodness. So often do, especially when composing electronic music, because you can just hit record and it'll capture, capture all the notes and stuff you play. So often will I just, when I'm recording, uh, just hit record, sit at the piano and play some chords. And the chord structure that develops is so cool. I end up building the song just around that about what just flow, uh, flowed out of my out of my fingertips to the piano. So it is creating music and creating visual art are similar in those ways that I, I really love embracing the flow, I suppose, if, if I can be any more woo woo with my language. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I do sincerely subscribe to the idea that, that I'm just a conduit for the universe to express itself through. I, it's, I have a difficult time taking compliments for my work because I really honestly just feel like I'm getting out of the universe's way. This is the universe doing its own thing. Anyone can do this. I think that's something else that I'm a huge proponent of is that anyone can be great. What, what is that in Ratatouille? Anyone can cook. <laughs> if, if I had a similar <laughs> book, <laughs> it would be anyone can be great at anything. <laughs> but you know, certainly there are stipulations. People have their ideas about things, but I, you know, I sincerely believe that if you, ah, there's this piano player, Kenny Warner. He's a phenomenal jazz pianist. He wrote this book called Infinite, uh, excuse me, Effortless Mastery. And he talks about the idea of things being difficult and really says that nothing is difficult, but unfamiliar. And that it is the more that you familiarize with something that it then becomes easy, but it's more so that it's become more familiar to you. And so that's, that's kind of the approach I'm taking when I say anyone can be great at something is that it really is just a process of familiarizing yourself with something. And sure, you know, something might take longer to familiarize, uh, a, a person might take longer to familiarize themselves with something than another person, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have the capacity to be as phenomenal. That's, yeah, that's my approach when I say anyone can be great. Yeah, and you also um, like use the word improvisation a lot when you were, especially when you're talking about your piece Two Lines and your portrait of your father. Um, mm. Do you like think you have some sort of like jazz mentality when approaching painting, maybe? <laughs> you know, that's such a good correlation. I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> yes, because when you're playing, especially as a bass player or so in a jazz band, you have the rhythm section and uh, that is the bass, the piano, the guitar, drums. That's, you know, the, generally the, the primary, the percussion, those, those are the instruments of the rhythm section. And oftentimes in jazz, what you're given is a skeleton of a song. And 
generally the horn players will have the melody on top of it. And you all just familiarize yourself with the skeleton of the song. So that whenever it comes to actually play it, you're just improvising. And I mean, jazz is, is really just everyone improvising, collective improvising. Um, and because I have so, I mean, I have so much experience in that there were years and years and years when I would perform probably 175 times or so uh, in that year. And so, you know, improvising so frequently, you just get so accustomed to feeling out what's next, uh, feeling out what another character in the painting, what another musician in the painting in reference to just kind of like some color or form within the painting itself, what they might be saying and just responding to that. It's really cool whenever I'm creating a painting that I'm improvising. Uh, so for instance, in uh, White Trapezoid, so many of those were color choices or improvisations in reactions to where I'd put a color. Like if I put red here, I'd want to make sure that I balanced red here and red here or something, you know, in, in specific, specific balances. Um, so that is one way that improvisation does kind of come out in painting as well. And I would definitely say that through music, I have become much more confident at just trusting my intuition because that's really what you're doing on the, on the stage when you're a jazz musician. Right on, thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, like Marissa said, don't be shy to unmute and ask those questions if you prefer to ask questions about his art or process or if you wanna uh, type it in the chat. Um, yeah. Quick question. Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of the process and improvisation, like, so let's say, I think it was a painting two lines that you you, you didn't really uh, sketch out beforehand, correct? That's correct, yeah, I can pull it up uh, here. Yeah, well, I guess like, like how long did that painting take, for example? Oh, what a good question. And you know, like how, what were the like, were there stages where it looked completely different? Hmm, I don't you know, know why it's not thing. wanting to. Okay, I'm just gonna do this. Yeah. Cool, awesome. There. Ah, that is a really good question. So I didn't necessarily sketch it out in, in terms of creating a study for it, but I did at least kind of give myself an outline with pencil on the panel before I started adding the paint. Okay. Um, so this one actually remained pretty similar uh, to that original sketch, but that does bring me to the point of this one where this one, okay, there's so much, there's so much symbolism going on with this one in mm -hmm. terms of improvising a, a piece in the bottom left. So each quadrant has its own meaning sentiment toward me. And the bottom left represents the unknown of COVID because that area shifted and changed so much. There were maybe three or four variants of what it looked like there before I finally decided on this one. And even to this day, I'm still interested in, in changing it. And I, in the process of creating this, I was aware of that, that, that this was reflecting how I was, how, how so much was changing so quickly. And so I definitely embraced that uh, whenever creating this one. Uh, I, I did just remember that you asked how long two lines took to make. I think if I remember correctly, two lines was maybe, 40 to 50 hours, that one was a relatively quick one. Um, okay. But the background, each of, what I would do is I would choose a color for this background and then just lay dots. And each of the layer, the dot layers took about an hour and there are about nine dot layers. So just oh. the background itself took around nine hours. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Here, I'll hop out of this and go back to the presentation view. There we go. Cool. Right on. Hi, Donna. I see hey, you're here now. Hi. I'm sorry I'm late. Um, so I'm sorry I missed some if I missed something or I'm repeating. But I did um visit KCAC this weekend with a friend, and um we were super impressed with your show. And my friend is way smarter about art, uh, about art, I can't even say the word, than I am. And she was getting some uh, Frida vibes from your painting of your father, and I think I mentioned it to you. And I was wondering, 
what were the vibes you had when you were going through that process painting that did that ever come into your mind or is just some other process you know that is really interesting um because there are a lot of ways to interpret you know that that comment the frida vibe uh because frida was was so phenomenal um uh, i think the way that i'm interpreting that question is is in terms of uh familial relationships um and and yeah that that one was really intense and oh my goodness that painting it's still so difficult for me to be in front of it because my like i said in the in the in the video my relationship with that man is very interesting we goodness so that painting i started um uh, i think in 2019 excuse me no 2020 uh, around march of 2020 and i invested about 40 hours of work into it and i had to stop I just got so angry <laughs> as I was working on that painting, just thinking about him and how, because I definitely went through quite a transition and transformation last year. And part of it included transforming my anger toward my dad to forgiveness and care and love. Not that I don't love him, I always have. It's just been really difficult sometimes to embrace that. Uh, and so in the process, you know, I invested those 40 hours. I said, okay, fine. I, I can, I can hit this painting again. I can begin to, you know, be in front of a, a portrait of this man again. And so I invested the final 55 hours into it. So that painting took just under a hundred hours. And, you know, very recently, actually, uh, we were, we had quite, quite a traumatic event, um, I still haven't talked to him in like three weeks and I really should because the, the time for actually acknowledging what happened is waning and I don't want to exist without acknowledging what happened. And so right now, just being in front of that painting kind of has all of that energy associated with it too. And it's so interesting, you know, I, okay, so I grew up in the church. I no longer relate to the, the vine through that path. Um, but I do really enjoy still checking out Bible verses, seeing how they might apply to, to life. And there's this one, Matthew 18, 21 through 22, it's where Jesus, Jesus, excuse me, Peter says, hey, Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone? Is it seven times? And, and Jesus is like, nah, Peter, homie, it's 70 times seven. <laughs> and I'm like, dang, you know, I really felt like I forgave my dad. And that's like the, the first level of forgiveness that allowed me to complete this painting. And now I'm understanding that it's going to be a, a game we continue to play. And, you know, I'll have to probably do that this time and then another time and another time. It's interesting. I'm reading this book right now. And, well, an article, I suppose, is, is what I read. And it was talking about how the family is not, those aren't consensual relationships. You don't consent to who your family is. And that's just really interesting to use that language and that perspective on family. Because, I mean, I wouldn't have chosen my dad to be my dad <laughs> if I give if given a choice. I mean, I'm grateful for who I, who I am. As a result, you know, I, I feel like I can uh, grow and learn from difficult situations. Uh, but goodness, you know, what an interesting human. So that's that's to answer your question about that painting. <laughs> oh, my God. Thanks for sharing. We got pretty deep there, Robert. That was awesome. It's yeah. funny. Not funny, but it's interesting because... The feelings that you are expressing that you went through through that process when i stood in front of the painting i felt all sorts of positive vibes mm. like peaceful soft um it, it was and of course you had the amazing frame around it which blew me away too um but it just felt so peaceful to me so it's interesting that um the process and the stuff you went through to paint it and stuff so it's interesting thanks for sharing yeah i'm i'm noticing that you sensing it as peaceful is making me tear up that you <gasps> that you sense that from it that's I really did. interesting i did huh. it and and so did my friend she was like feeling really peaceful with it hmm. <laughs> wow cool thanks for uh, sharing Maybe in the next visit will be different. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now that you have the, the background story. <laughs> uh, dang. Robert, has your father seen the painting? Yeah, yeah, he has. 
Uh, he's what are not, his feelings about it? Yeah, he's, he's not necessarily one to express his sentiments too vocally. He, he came over and saw it and he was like, oh, wow, cool, good job. And that was about it. <laughs> that was about it. Uh, but I know that he loves it. I mean, he has always encouraged us to be artistic um, through life, which is, you know, really cool. I'm, I, I recognize how beautiful that is to have parents that support being creative. You know, they had me playing piano in second grade and they made me stick with music. I wanted to quit music so badly in seventh grade, but they made me stick with it. And I'm so glad. I mean, obviously I'm so glad that's like, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite things to do is, is create and play music. Um, but yeah, they, they always prompted us to be creative. My dad was always drawing, sketching, doodling, always buying us art supplies and stuff, even though that was not something that I ever explicitly expressed interest in. Uh, so I know, I know that he's pretty jazzed on, on what's happening. It's cool, to see, it's cool to see Jake and Paula here. Hey, Jake and Paula, nice to see you all. You don't have to unmute or anything or, or on video or rather turn it on. I just wanted to say hi, acknowledge your presence. Hey, hey, Robert, I actually had a question. Uh, you mentioned that you don't uh, you don't listen to music while you paint, which is interesting to me. But have you ever you know, thought about or have you ever displayed your art with your music at the same time, like had the music playing while that your your art was up? Yeah. So interesting that you bring that up. There is actually for this painting that you can actually, that you can see behind Marissa, the, the excuse me, the exhibit, uh, I did create an album of music to accompany the majority of the paintings on display there. Um, it is, I'm not entirely sure if you're maybe explaining some sort of like formal presentation where people like sit down, listen to a song and look at one, maybe in a group setting or something. But for this exhibit here, uh, you can sc scan a QR code in front of the exhibit that will take you to this album where you can then, if you bring your own headphones, listen to it. I think that is uh, a, a, probably the preferred approach to it. Uh, I th we tried having a speaker. We did have a speaker in there, um, but there was just so many logistical errors that were happening and uh, mostly just with, with Bandcamp's play count limit. Uh, that was, I think, well, let me backtrack. I experienced it for, my, for myself uh, recently for the first time listening to the music and being in front of the painting. And I greatly enjoyed that experience because I saw things in my own paintings that I had not ever seen before, just having the music accompanying in it. Uh, and that was so mind blowing. That was cool. So I think that at least for myself, that's my preferred format to experience this. Um, I think, you know, even composing for like a live little orchestra, that could be a really cool idea. Hmm. Yeah, there, there are always a lot of possibilities. I don't know if that necessarily answers your question, Jake, um, but. Yeah, there, there is actually some music that accompanies it in the chat here. You, there's a, the link to where you can check it out. All right. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. Well, uh, we're, uh, we'll have to come up and see the show probably this weekend, and uh, I'll check that out for sure. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, it, uh, Jake and I recently met. So my part-time job is at the Apple Store, and I recently helped Jake. What, you had a, uh, your display was cracked? Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah my, ba my back, my back uh, not the display, oh, the but back the back panel. Cracked. Was, yeah. Right on. Cool. And it just, you said that your wife is on the KCSE, uh, some affiliation? Yeah, she's, yeah, she's on the board. She's yeah. sitting here with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Wow. It's really beautiful when those, when paths intersect like that. Yeah, no, it was, it was great to meet you. It was, uh, great work. Yeah, it's great to see um, your, your art. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would be interested in, if no one has an immediate question and kind of diving a little bit deeper into the painting, uh, social, hashtag social distancing, if y'all don't mind. Yeah, let's do it. Cool, let's hop back over here. Okay, so with this one, as I said, each quadrant kind of has its own existence or meaning. In the top left hand corner, that one kind of is more so about the future of COVID, whereas the bottom left is about the present, I suppose. Uh, yeah, the top left is, is more so about the, the future, where in this circular bit that comes off of the main structure in the top left that has 
those curved rectangles kind of zooming in and out. That was actually meant to represent the, the human genome, the A, T, adenine, guanine, thias, uh, T, and guan, A, T, C, G, you know the ones I'm referring to for DNA, uh, where those combinations of letters are, are what create genes and dictate how the body is formed. And I was doing some research on viruses and came across the idea of retroviruses, which are essentially viruses that have embedded themselves in the human genome. And this idea is so fascinating to me because retroviruses are so important to human development that they are responsible for things such as the placenta, for the proteins that allow memory to exist. And so I'm really interested as you know, COVID-19 is a virus that has become so widespread, will that then become a retrovirus? And will that affect human evolution over time? You know, that is a, a really interesting concept to me uh, that I wanted to include in here. Uh, in the top left, the top, top left, uh, talking again about how this quadrant is more so about the future, those, that triangular shape and then the ovular shape are kind of meant to be younglings, young humans, infants coddled and, and cradled in, in just these unknown shapes, these uh, kind of suspended shapes. Uh, and who knows how they will be affected by this. You know, seeing people with masks for, my nephew is two, and for half of his life, he has seen people in masks. And that's just, I'm curious to know, you know, how, how he will be affected through that. I'm curious to know how my 16 year old sister who was in high school juggling with online school and, and all this, you know, I would try to go over, my wife would go over as well and, and help her um, with her homework. And, you know, she was just so inundated with, with these things. And who knows if she was actually learning anything. I mean, who knows if we actually really pay attention in high school anyway, but this, you know, I'm, I'm just so, fascinated by that not in any sort of positive or negative way it's really just a neutral outlook or approach that I have to it. like what's what's going to happen and then beneath that the little blue structure is almost like an upside down crown and that is just meant to represent that the virus COVID-19 looks like a crown under a microscope so that was one thing that I wanted to, to touch base in there and then this top right corner, okay, there's a specific scene in Glenn, I think maybe you were in the, I think maybe you were in the studio when I was telling you about this, the exhibit, or maybe someone else, but the top right, there's a scene that I remember when there were a bunch of Italian folks on their balconies, and they were all kind of interacting with each other, they were singing, they were doing their barbecues, their picnics, these sorts of things. This rectangle, this this vertical rectangle that exists in the top right-hand corner, or in the, in the top right quadrant, was feels like one of those balconies to me or one of those structures where if you notice off to the side there's a face kind of to represent a face uh, uh, that might be leaning out of the balcony the face is the yellow is the, the skin it's got a little tuft of hair this little 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 bump for a nose the square with a black circle in, is the eye and that I was really in that moment abstracting my vision of the people on their balconies in Italy uh, just doing their own interactions having fun. So that's a little bit of insight into to how I <laughs> present some things or how I translate an, an idea. Hmm. Right on. I have um, one question, Robert, in regards to the music. You're, you appear, at least, to be very collaborative. Um, and I think something that is unique about the music aspect is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, you compose the music, um, but then others that you selected within your community uh, wrote the words and performed um, those lyrics over the music you wrote in some of the songs. And kind of, can you talk about that and just how you selected those individuals and was there a rhyme or reason? I imagine there is. Yeah, yeah, really, really great question. Yes, I, uh, as Marissa stated, I do really love collaborating. Uh, I love collaborating. On pretty much all of my musical projects, there's some form of collaboration. There's one album I worked on that has 29 musicians. So that was really fun to organize. <laughs> but on this one, on this collection of seven songs, there are eight guests, which is just so fun to have people 
you know, join in and infuse their energy in the, into the project. And the poets, so the, hmm, let's see, there's, there's uh, Jeff Hasno, who is Jeff Mason. He is one of my best friends from kindergarten. He is such a poet. He is such a wordsmith. Oh my goodness. I really recommend listening to the album to, to hear his, the words he wrote for the drummer. It was interesting because uh, some of the poets, actually only one of the poets had the music before they wrote to the painting. So only Jose Faust had the music and the painting when he went to write. Uh, Jose Faust is a, an, he's an everything -er. He does everything, uh, poetry, theater, um, painting, murals. He's phenomenal. Jose Faust does everything. And so he wrote a poem to one of, one of these and he came to the studio, the room I'm in, and he read his poem uh, and we recorded it. That was phenomenal. Jeff, th Jeff's was really interesting actually because he didn't know that the drummer is not technically a square, but he approached it as if it was. So he has four verses and each of the verses have the same character count to <laughs> emulate a square. <laughs> not even word count, character count. <laughs> oh, I love Jeff. He's, yeah, my best friend since kindergarten, mastermind. He's awesome. Uh, let's see, Melissa uh, Fair. She is such a, a powerful human. She, I really love her energy. Um, and so she wrote a poem for embracing change. She said like one night she just woke up in the middle of the night and wrote it out. It just came to her. So that was pretty fortunate that 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 works so f fluidly on that same track. Um, so I led a band for a few years called the Sextet. We have three albums. On that first album, it's the formation that I had when I lived in Portland. And the saxophone player from that group is the one who recorded the solo on that, on that track. So that was cool. On the song that I wrote for the portrait of my dad, that one, okay. So I wrote a letter to my dad and I wrote it in English, but I wanted it to be super, super personal. And so my dad speaks Mayan. He speaks the Yucatec dialect of Mayan. And so I had a friend in Mexico City who does like PSAs. He does a lot of radio programming translations in Mayan for the Mayan community. I had him translate the poem. I translated it to Spanish for him. And then he translated it into Mayan and is reading it on that track. Uh, so that's really interesting. I'm also playing a pre-Hispanic Mayan instrument on that track called the Ompash. It's like the didgeridoo. It's an instrument that was that's very similar to the to the didgeridoo, but developed independently. Uh, it's made of the maguey plant, which is essentially a, a giant aloe vera plant, the central stock. It's super light, and it gets this really low guttural sound. It's really fun to play that instrument. Let's see. I think. Oh, and then I wrote a poem for one of the tracks. Uh, but yeah, that's <laughs> that's the the to answer your question, Marissa. The the poets who are on the track and a little bit of their backgrounds. So just a quick follow-up question um, based on your response. So that, did the artist get to select the artwork that they wrote for, or did you select the artist for the artwork? Another great question. I selected the artist for the artwork. Uh, I actually okay. talked with Jeff about that. I, I said, hey, Jeff, I'm not entirely sure how uh, I'm not entirely sure how to go about this. And we came up together that it made the most sense to go ahead and, and select a painting for someone. Um, that way, because then I would be able to connect someone with who I think they would shine the brightest with, uh, excuse me, in terms of connecting the painting with the, the poet. And that way, the next poet that would ask didn't have like one less to choose from. Uh, you know, maybe one that they wanted to write for would have already been chosen. This, it just made it a little bit simpler of a process if I dictated who would write for which. And I promise this is my last question about this. <laughs> so do you, um, I just am so curious, I'm so fascinated by this, but I guess my last question is, um, do you give them any background about the paintings? Like tonight you really unveiled the work. So we've really had an opportunity to, to get your vision, your understanding of the work, but do they get that or do they just respond um, how they wish? Yeah, another three for three with the great questions. Uh, I did give them about a paragraph each, maybe two paragraphs. I don't know. I didn't want to give them too much, but I also did want to give a little bit of context. So yeah, 
I, I did. There are there have been some instances where I've had friends write for projects blind, and that's cool. That results. It's that's always so interesting to see the correlations that exist unintentionally. Uh, but this one, yeah, yeah, there was there was a little bit of background that I gave them before they began writing. Cool. Great questions. Thanks, Marissa. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering. Right on in, so, Isabel, that, that takes us to 7.30. I don't know if you yeah. want to leave room if anyone has any other questions or. Yeah, um, I was just going to say if anyone else had questions, feel free to unmute or to ask them. Um, speak now, forever hold your peace. Um, <laughs> but if not, we're going to sign off here. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And thank you so much, Robert, for sharing yourself with us. Um, this was really great. Robert, I just want to say I'm blown away by your journey. I really can't wait to see what you do next. Um, just, it's, it's just, I can't wait. Um, and oh. I, yeah. So thank, thank you, you so Donna. much. No problem. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. It's really fun how much has happened in such a short amount of time. Yeah. I, I'm also just kind of along for the ride, excited to see what will happen. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, KCAC. Thank you. Bye. Peace out, everyone. Bye, everyone.